I've never thought of myself as a perfect mother, and I've always known I was never going to be one. When I was 18, I got pregnant with a guy I had only been with one time. His name was Brad, and he was the class bad boy. When I told him I was pregnant, he switched schools the very next day. I tried texting him, calling him, but nothing worked. He blocked me, and it was clear I was on my own. I'm kind of religious, and there was no way I was having an abortion. I made it through ridicule at school, teachers using me as an example, and nine months of aching everything. And he was born. I don't even have my driver's license, and I was holding my baby boy in my arms. I was so scared. I named him Andrew. And soon it was just him and I against the world. My parents kicked me out, and I had to make it on my own. I was super scared, but I managed to make a life for myself, getting my diploma and getting a job. I mean, sure, that job was working double shifts at two separate fast food restaurants. Sure, I smelled like grease all the time. Sure, no man would come within 500 feet of me at any given time. But I had a two-bedroom apartment with my son. I was someone. When Andrew was about six, things started to go downhill. For a week straight, he was throwing up seriously anything he ate. The doctors started to think it was cancer. I was so scared my heart was pounding. It turns out he had some other health issues, so they had to do a few different surgeries and put a tube in his stomach. I was afraid he wasn't going to make it. Every time I had to go to work or class, Andrew would throw a hissy fit. I'm not proud of myself, but I screamed at him. I was so overtired, so overworked, that I told him he was being ungrateful and I needed to work to keep us going. The second the babysitter arrived at the door, I left. I just couldn't handle him. About 30 minutes later, I got a call from the babysitter. Andrew is gone, she screamed. What do you mean Andrew is gone, I yelled back. I assumed maybe he was hiding in the attic or his playhouse because I yelled at him. But when I got home, I knew that wasn't the reality. His clothes were gone. He took his favorite stuffed animal. My son was gone. Gone. The next few hours were a blur of crying and talking to the police. They asked the babysitter and me what had happened to him and no one at Andrew that day. And that put me at the top of the police's suspect list. I just wanted them to find my baby. Every day, it seemed like there was less and less of a chance of them finding my son. The police were at my house daily. I felt like I was losing my mind. Then at 4 a.m., they called to tell me that Andrew had been found. I drove to the station to pick him up, tears in my eyes. The police told me he had been found wandering outside the police station, confused and crying. He didn't know where he had come from or what had happened, but he knew his name. I raced in to see my son. Only, it wasn't my son. I felt like throwing up. The kid looked almost exactly like my son, but there was something weird about him. It was almost like someone had made a fake version of my son. He had the same smile, the same face, the same shape, but his eyes were all wrong. What should have been a happy moment absolutely wasn't. But you know what the kid did? He ran up and hugged me, saying, Mommy, I missed you. I hugged him back with tears in my eyes. Maybe it was my son. I rushed back out to speak with the detectives. As I was leaving, the kid cried after me, asking where I was going. When I told the detectives I didn't think he was my son, they all rolled their eyes. If he's not your son, then where is he? Did you do something with him? He called you Mommy. I felt like I was being backed into a corner. They were basically saying I either murdered my own son or I was trying to abandon him. I thanked the officers and I took the kid out of there. The whole ride home, I was trying to calm myself down. But every time I looked in the rear view, I saw the kid's eyes. He was just staring at me. I decided to play along, asking him where he had gone and what was going on with him. He said, I was gone for a while, but I'm back now, mommy. His voice even sounded different. That night, I laid him in bed. He asked for his normal bedtime story. Was I going crazy? Obviously, an imposter wouldn't know he had a favorite. Later that night, I fell asleep. But when I woke up, 
the kid was standing in the doorway, just staring at me. I asked him what was going on, and he said he wanted to lay in bed with me. I let him sleep beside me, but my heart was racing the whole time. I had my son back. Why couldn't I just relax? What was wrong with me? Maybe him going missing had just shaken my head up or something? But when I woke up the next morning, I knew something was wrong. The entire left side of my bed had been torn to shreds. The pillow, the blanket, everything. I walked out to find Andrew lying in his own bed. He acted like he had no idea what I was talking about. He said he had never come in the room. Things just got worse from there. When Andrew got back to school, I got constant calls from the teacher telling me he was mean to classmates. He even threw a stapler at someone. She also mentioned something that made my skin crawl. Apparently, Andrew couldn't read or write anymore. Before he went missing, Andrew was constantly making me little books and writing stories. I knew he understood reading and writing. At home, I would catch Andrew standing in my doorway every night. He wouldn't eat anything except for cereal and milk, even though my little Andrew had been allergic to milk since he was a baby. I started trying to talk to friends about it, and they all thought I was going insane. They told me I should be grateful to have my son back. Every time I said I didn't think it was my son, they rolled their eyes. Then I noticed Andrew was drawing strange symbols all over his bedroom. It creeped me out so much. When I told him to stop, he would start hitting me. Was my kid possessed by the devil or something? The very next day, we went to the park, and I looked across the street. I swear I saw Andrew, my real Andrew, playing in a yard. I ran through the street, racing after him, but when I got there, the kid was gone. I couldn't take not knowing anymore. One night, I waited in the hallway for Andrew to fall asleep. When he did, I tiptoed into the bedroom. He had had that stomach tube years ago and had a pretty nasty scar. If this was my child, I would learn the truth. I carefully, carefully lifted up his shirt to see. There was no scar. This wasn't my son, just like I had suspected all along. I gasped and the kid sat up in bed. I couldn't hold it in anymore. I started yelling, asking where my real son was, asking where he came from. The kid started sobbing. He told me a man picked him up from an orphanage and sent him over here and told him what to do. He said he hadn't wanted to cut up the pillows or wake me up, but the man said he would know and send him back to the orphanage if he hadn't. I could feel my heart shattering. This poor little orphan had basically been blackmailed. He told me his real name was Cyrus. I asked if he knew where the man's house was. The boy nodded and said he could show me the way. We drove through the city until we reached a little cottage. I told the boy to stay in the car. I had to find out who was inside. When I arrived, the house looked familiar. I realized it had been the house I saw the boy playing in earlier. I called the cops and told them there was a kidnapped child, but I couldn't wait. Knowing my Andrew was in the house, possibly getting hurt, I couldn't just stand there. I banged on the door. To this day, my heart drops when I think about who I saw on the other side. It was Brad, Andrew's father. It suddenly made sense in a sick and twisted way. Behind him, I could see Andrew sitting on the couch. I shoved Brad aside and ran to Andrew, holding him in my arms, while Brad screamed at me for keeping him away from his kid. When we arrived at the police station, everything came to light. Brad had gone to the house, told Andrew he was his dad, and asked Andrew if he wanted to come with him. Andrew was upset because I had been gone all the time and had just yelled at him, so he went with him. When the search was all over the news, Brad knew he couldn't hold the police off much longer. He went to every adoption agency in the area until he found Cyrus. He sent Cyrus to the police station, scared him into playing along, and that was that. I apologized for being gone so much to Andrew and explained that none of this was his fault, but that I had to work hard to support us. I told him I would put more effort into protecting him. That's when I realized Cyrus suddenly didn't have a home. This poor boy had been in an orphanage, been adopted and emotionally abused, and now he was going to have to go back? I knew what I had to do. I talked to the police and the adoption agency, and they managed to approve me caring for Cyrus. Since I was on my way to becoming a nurse, within the next year, I would be more available and really able to give my sons the attention they deserved. Eventually, things took a turn for the better. 
I was very glad that Brad was never part of my son's upbringing, not just for being a horrible person, but also for being stupid enough to think his plan would work. Oh, let-